In January 2019, Eduardo entered the nutrition hospital in Mexico City and was diagnosed with chronic liver damage and two liver tumors in the upper area of the right side. Next to them, a tumor thrombosis. The doctors told him that he's not a candidate for a liver transplant or any other procedure that can give him expectation of a cure. All they offered him was to take chemotherapy as a palliative measure and because of the severity of his illness. They gave him a life expectancy of less than 12 months. The only recommendation was to take chemotherapy indefinitely, not as a cure, but as a palliative measure to see if he could improve his life expectancy. <laughs>
healed. So in December, I went to do the test, the test that I had to do for the liver. What they found, there was cancer in the liver. Wow. So I started to do all the, all the medical tests, how bad this diagnosis was. In two hospitals here in my city in Leon. Leon is like five hours drive north from Mexico City. In my city, I went to two hospitals to check on how bad it was. And the doctors told me that because of the two tumors in the liver, tumoral thrombosis that I had, arteria, that there was nothing to do. And they gave me like less than 12 months of, of life expectancy. And so the recommendations of the doctors in here in Leon was that if I could find some solution, if there was any, that I had to do either to Monterrey or Mexico City because that is like the two main cities in the country. So I decided to go to Mexico City, the traditional hospital in Mexico City. What the, what the doctors told me there is that the same thing that the doctors told me in, in, in the L. There was nothing to do, see? And the only thing that they recommended for me to do was to take chemotherapy. Just as you said, Lilian, not, not as a cure, but only as a palliative. And one of those alternatives is that I took a trip out of Mexico, but because since the doctors here in Mexico told me that there was nothing to do for me, I decided to go to Italy. And this is kind of like where everything started for me because I have a sister who lives in Italy for she's been there for 10 years now and her her father-in-law he is been cancer free for the last eight years they they diagnosed him a, a very big tumor in his stomach so it has to be operated he had to take chemotherapy after the doctors in, in Italy uh, helped him to eliminate the cancer cells he found some oncologists in the city of Rome who told him my sister's father-in-law is Peppino so they told Peppino that it, it this oncologist told him if you trust in me we're gonna help you appear help you so the, the cancer cell would not ever appear again in your body so they they gave him I, I'm seeing this this picture all the pills that they uh, asked him to take phytopharmacos these pills made of plants and roots to help them to, it, it was for the to, to strengthen his immune system but also to help the, his internal cells to prevent and not to let his body to reproduce cancer cells again. So they're a nutraceutical, do you call them um, phytos phytoceuticals? Yeah. Yeah, so they're from the plant, that's why phyto, but yeah, they're nutraceutical, so they're made from plant, pure plant sources. Is this the picture of- well, the pills that I had to take. So these yeah. are all the pills, is this for one day then? All these- One pills? week, one week. No, if it was for one day, I would be dead of now, by now. I was going to say, that's crazy. <laughs> One week is still a lot. I had to take pills in the morning, evening, afternoon, night. All day I had to, had to be taking care of doses of pills that I had to take. And this doesn't count the chemotherapy that I was also taking and also the injections I was taking. The other picture, how I was kind of looking when I was taking the chemotherapy. By then, the only side effect that I had was the effects of the chemotherapy. For some reason, I remember that doing my prayers and my meditation, I was asking to God all the time that please not let me to start feeling the side effects because I said that at the time, if I started to feel some uh, secondary effects, of the, of the diagnosis that they gave me, I was not going to be able to find the cure I was looking for. I was, I was definitely very concerned about, I was going to find my miracle. I had to find it, but I knew that if I started to feel these symptoms, it was going to be very hard. I think that I was not going to be able to find the solution. So I think it was the first gift that I received from the divinity was that I, all this period of time, I had no side effects. When you went to the doctor the very first time, time due to the blood that you found in when you went to the bathroom you didn't have pain at all with all these things going on no it's incredible it is it, incredible because just yeah. a thrombocytopenia should have been very painful let alone the hepatitis c can be painful on your yeah. liver you had multiple tumors but you didn't have any discomfort you didn't have any pain you were completely asymptomatic yeah that's something i have to be very thankful to god for that because i have the possibility to not just to transit all that to learn a lot so i can now share it i have had the chance to talk with a lot of ill people who has all the 
other symptoms, for some reason, I didn't have the side effects, but I understood perfectly what to have a, a terminal diagnosis means. It doesn't matter that I wasn't feeling anything. The doctors kept telling me that my life expectancy was for August uh, 2019. It says yeah. life is in jail, life expectancy greater than six months. Yeah, and it says six months. Doctors okay. gave me that on February. I know how it feels that the doctor tells you and insists in saying to you because of your cancer, there's nothing for you to do. I understand that I can be very em empathic with people that has the cancer. It doesn't matter if you're feeling asymptomatic or you're feeling the symptoms. I think that the process that some people has to go through in order to learn something, to find a way to put your attentions into divinity or high intelligence, to help you to get cured, even though they have the symptoms or if they don't have them, they have to do the same process. That's what I believe. Yeah. That's Eduardo, I'm noticing something very, I think, extraordinary because here you're feeling fine. You're asymptomatic. The only thing is that your eyes are seeing the evidence of, of blood when you went to the bathroom, which propelled you rightfully so to go to the doctor. Thank goodness you didn't ignore that. You went to the doctor and then the doctor now gives you this explosive report of not one, not two, but you have half a dozen things that are going wrong. Cirrhosis of the liver, thrombocytopenia, low blood platelets, hepatitis C, and the tumors. So that's a lot, and you're not feeling anything. That's invisible. You don't have symptoms other than the blood, but you have to believe the gravity of your condition, even though you don't feel anything. On the flip side, taking you know your control back so that you're like, okay, I may not feel any of the negative pain or any of those things that normally would come along with this. But I have to believe that yes, that something is seriously going wrong with your body. That same thing has to be applied in your belief that even though you don't see anything, you have to believe blindsided that you are going to get yourself healthy. So you, you, it's like a double blind. It's almost like a yin yang I'm seeing here as you're telling this story. Like you're pain blind, but you weren't belief blind. On both ends, you weren't belief blind. You knew that there would be a way that you could obtain a miracle that would put you in good health. I returned from Italy to Mexico after a couple of months of being there. What I realized from being in Italy is that not, not meat. I had to change my food diet because they told me that I had not also take the phytopharmacals, but I had to change my diet. It had to be very organic at all. I learned that when I, when I was in Italy. And then when I came back, I realized that it was gonna be very hard for me to keep that diet in Mexico because here we don't have the culture of eating organic or, or having organic food. And in Europe, in Italy, it's like you go to any store and you can find a lot of, maybe 40% of the things that they're selling is organic. Here we wouldn't have this culture yet. Could you share with us, what did you eat before? Give us examples of your daily meals. As you know, in here in Mexico, we eat a lot of hot food. We like a lot of spicy food. We eat a lot of fat and carbohydrates and sugar. We need to eat a lot of tortilla and eggs and rice. It's not a very healthy way of eating the Mexican food. When you are healthy, it's not like it's going to cause you a big trouble. I have this diagnosis is one of those things was like a venom on my body when I came back I was thinking that it was gonna be very hard for me to keep this strict diet I, I thought that I found like the 20% of the miracle that I was looking for I still had to keep trying to find the 80% that I was had to look for matter to matter still yeah of course now that you've had dr. Joe's teeth doing the organic diet it helped but like you said it's only 20% so you were still you were correcting your health matter to matter yeah, and I didn't know any of that by then. When I came back, I realized I had the opportunity to start reading and watching videos of Dr. Joe. I also read another book that helped me a lot. This doctor's name is Carl Simonton. This book is The Healing Journey. This book is from an oncologist. He wrote this book for people with terminal cancer diagnosis. This book invites people to live a changing life process that concerns not only physical, but also mental and spiritual changes. And for me, that resonated in my ears very strong because that, that was exactly what I was looking for. Some other thing that the book 
said, if you have this cancer diagnosis, a person, it's a compelling reason to learn and to, and to change. I had no time to waste, but I also had to find very fast what I was looking for to start applying it on my life. And the book started to give me a lot of lights of what to do. And one of the things that I like the most from this book, I recommend it to, to all the people that, that has this diagnosis, not terminal, but if they have this cancer uh, diagnosis, to read this book, it's really a, a very helpful tool. It also says, that the most important message behind cancer is that it is a message of love. Now, for me, it was like a, an impossible thing to read for a person that has cancer. How it can be possible that somebody says that you have the cancer and the message that it's trying to send you is a love message. For some reason, I was ready to start to put myself, start to connect all myself into that frequency, into that stage of love. I kept reading Dr. Joe's books. And I remember one time, it was made, I returned from Italy in the month of April. So I left to Italy at the beginning of February. In April, I was back home in Mexico. So it was May. I was watching Dr. Joe's videos. And then I remember that I saw this video. He was being interviewed in, in London. And then he said in this video that all the people that go to his workshop, they are witnessing miracles of biblical proportions. Yeah, biblical proportions. When I heard that, I said, I have to go. I have to, I don't I don't know what I have to do, but I have to go there. I have to be in one of his seminars because it was May. And I remember that the last diagnosis said that my time left was in August. So I said, I know that that if I go there, I'm going to find the 80% left that I am looking for to know how to heal myself, how to be cured. So I went there and it was a miracle itself for me to find a way to be there because it was May, probably the second month, the second week of the month. When I entered to, to do the applications to attend to, the, to this seminar, of course, he was going to say, I didn't know that he has all his seminars uh, sold out months before they started. Yeah. So when I went to try to find if there was some seminar close in the border of Mexico City. I said, if I can find a seminar in California or Arizona or Texas, the first miracle for me was that I saw that it was going to be one in Mexico next month in June. I said, wow, well, it's fantastic. So when I see if I could attend, I, I tried to, to do my application and it says that it was already sold out. Yeah. It has two months that it had been sold out. They also told me, if, but if you want to re register yourself and if there is a cancellation we can tell you that because of that cancellation, you can come in. And I said, no, it's not going to happen because I've seen that in Spain, it's sold out. In Germany, it's sold out. In Every Berlin, it's sold out. I, there was no, there was not going to be any cancellation. So what I did, I decided to send an email directly to Dr. Joe Dispenza. In this email, they are receiving the registrations for the seminar. I didn't even know if he was going to receive it, but I, I put on the email, did Dr. Dear Dr. Joe Dispenza, you don't know me, but for me, it's imperative to be next uh, month in your seminar because then I explained my situation. And so the next the next day, I, I received an answer and it said that... The next Dr. day? Yeah, yeah, and it said, it said that Dr. Joe had written the message and he was going to do an exception for me. He, he has never done an exception before, but he was going to do an exception for me. But I remember that on my email, I also, I also put that I had no money to attend. So I was, I was asking for a scholarship. And wow. the answer is that Dr. Joe said that, yes, it's okay and we're respecting you, but unfortunately we cannot give you a scholarship because all the scholarships have already uh, been given. Oh. So if you want to attend, you have to pay the whole fee. We need you to let us know as soon as possible that you're coming. And so I said, right there, I answered, of course I'm going to be there. I had to think how I was going to do so the money to be there. So I spent that day, the whole sending emails, WhatsApps to relatives, friends that they know that they knew about my situation, but th uh, that I also know that they could, uh, if I asked them for help, that they could help, they were going to help. I think like it was like after 36 hours, some friends were going to help me to pay the plane and the seminar and the food and the hotel and everything. I was blessed for that. Wow. And, uh, uh, Linian, I remember I, did, I didn't stay at the hotel. I, I had to drive one hour every day to get to the hotel because I was staying at the hometown in Cancun. You didn't know that. No, you I don't know how you did that because we were there, you know. We had to be in the, to start yeah, the session at six o'clock and sometimes at four o'clock. So I had to drive one hour, one hour to be there. And I just, oh my, and I just. 
That's incredible because, I mean, I stayed at the hotel. It was like 12 to 14 and a half hours a day, which didn't leave us much time to go have dinner. If you were yeah. staying at the hotel, it was easier because after you're done with the main you know, event in the monastery, then you go into your team meetings, which is another hour. And then we go to dinner. Now it's like nine o'clock at night. That takes you to like 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night. And so like for the nights that we had to be there at 3.30 in the morning, cause they closed the doors at 4 a.m. Cause that's when the meditation started. That only left you like three hours if you're lucky to sleep. Yeah. And so I don't know how you did it. Oh my gosh. That was enough for me because I was exploding in my heart. I understood after that what the whole seminar meant for me because I remember myself driving every morning, even the dawn it was, driving to the hotel sometimes at three o'clock in the morning to, to, to be at the hotel. The whole hour driving, I was crying. Couldn't understand what I was so happy just by driving to the hotel. And then I realized that uh, I, I, was, I was being taught what faith means. I remember like here in Mexico, there is this tradition that it, I, I think that it also is a tradition in the United States that in, in December, you write a letter, it's magician kings, the, the kings that went to visit Jesus oh. was born and Wise kings, yeah. it's a tradition <laughs> here yeah, it's a tradition here in Mexico that uh, you're a kid you write a letter to these magician kings to ask them for gifts you just don't know since you're a kid you just don't know how these kings how they do or deliver gifts to all the children in the world and but for some reason in yourself, in your heart, you know that the day that you are supposed to go to this Christmas tree to see if they are, you, if your gifts are there, you're gonna find exactly the, the three gifts that you asked for. Oh, and that's, so you can ask for three gifts. Yeah, you can ask for three gifts. I just felt like that when I was driving to the hotel in, in, at the seminar, to, to be at the seminar with Joe, Dr. Joe, because I knew that I was writing Every night I was driving my car to go to the seminar. I was going to go to be there to write my letter of, of the gifts that I wanted to receive, just like if I was a kid, because I was going to send intention to the same divinity that these children believed when they wrote their letter to receive their gifts. For me, that's what faith means. That's the intention that Dr. Joe talks about when he says, if you want to change your life, you have to have a clear intention. That's faith for me. It's a faith that it's a knowingness, a belief where it's absolute. Yeah, and, and th that's why I was so happy. The people that I, I have contact with after this seminar, it, it's been more than a year now, and they told me that I, they couldn't understand why I was so happy since I had this diagnosis. It was like exploding of joy and, and happiness and, and gratitude because I already knew that for me being there, I was going to learn what I had to do, not only to heal myself, but to change my life. Wow. Through that belief and through that self-love, you were able to manifest the miracle. You were able to go to an event that was sold out. And then you were able to even provision it by knowing that it would be provided. You were able to get <laughs> the hotel, the airfare, everything that was required for you to show up to the event. So now you're in this gratitude and appreciation, which we learned while in the monastery is that gratitude and appreciation are the ultimate states of receivership. And Dr. Joe then shows us not just from the mystical and esoteric teachings, but he gives us the hard science to show us that when we are in a state of gratitude and appreciation, which is the ultimate state of receivership, how our body creates endorphin, our autonomic nervous system upregulates genes to suppress DNA that has been turned on that should be turned off and vice versa. So the expression of whatever is not good in your body starts to get balanced, takes it up a notch from there. But you were already in that place of accepting, receiving and embracing all of that, knowing what you had asked for had been given. And now you just had to be present every day and just follow his guidance. Yes, absolutely. And for some reason, I just didn't know that in my heart, I already knew this. So when I was at the seminar, it, I was exploding because there was this Dr. Joe explaining it to me in detail, what it was all that I was, transformation that, that it was happening inside of me. And he was giving me also the tools 
So I, I was going to have a method to work with. I could be not only working on that for healing, but for changing a lot of things of my life and also for creating a new future. And that's the fantastic thing that I found when I was with Dr. Joe. We're all blessed that we were all able to be healers which I thought was a profound experience in Cancun. And I was blessed to have you as one of my golden eagles. You were part of my group of 60 golden eagles. Yes, we got yes. to know each other and we faced all <laughs> those challenges that I don't know if you knew, but I didn't know before I went. Probably good that I didn't know because I didn't know they were going to have us walk that 50 foot plank. That may have curbed me from going. So I was ignorant that there was a challenge course. I had no idea. Was it your first time also? Yeah, when I went to the monastery in June of last, of 2019, that was my very first time. Okay. <laughs> and so I thought it was all in, in, the, in the monastery. I had no idea that there was a challenge course somehow. Okay. The divine maybe knew that maybe I might chicken out <laughs> if I knew about those things because I had a fear of heights. And that was actually one of the, one of, I've used the feeling that you have over and over again since then. So it was so perfect that I had to go through that. But yeah, so that was my first time okay. in June. So that's where I met you. And I didn't realize the gravity of how severe your medical condition was until after we left. As you know, I was, I was the one who formed the, Jace had me form the WhatsApp group for the Golden Eagles. And then I started realizing, oh my gosh, your diagnosis was a lethal diagnosis. What was your first either aha or a mystical experience or notion that some, maybe did you feel any energy moving? Because some people do, do feel energy moving in their bodies and are healed and others feel nothing. All of a sudden they realize it happens different for everybody. So what was it like for you? Well, I think I'm very, I'm very blessed for that because I, I feel this almost every day. That was the reason why uh, I was crying every day that I was driving to, to the hotel because I was having very profound experiences every day. What I can tell you is that one of the things that really touched me very deep, besides what I was having experiencing uh, with the uh, meditations, was the time you remember F.G. F. G. Mueller, the girl who gave her testimony from Holland, and she had had cancer also, and her diagnosis was three months left. It was Thursday, and I remember that when she walked up the stage and she started to say what her experience was, and that she had no experience ever before of meditating or, or any kind of work like this. And, but she said the doctors told her that there was nothing left for her to do. Well, I think a living example of uh, that this, this work really works. So basically, uh, and Joe, the former me, so the old me, was uh, diagnosed about, I think, three years ago with cervical cancer. I uh, had surgery and was thought to be, well, okay. But, well, the cancer got back in like a couple of months and they said it was so severe, it was so aggressive. Uh, it had, I don't know, in a couple of months spread out all across, you know, my whole belly to the peritoneum, I think. So the, the, in, the lining, you know, across all your organs. And, well, there was uh, tumors the size of kiwis, the size of, uh, well, there was like a whole big fruit basket in there. It was a mess. <laughs> they said, we, well, we looked at the scan and they said it's all white, I guess. There's it's covered all over. So basically they said there's a 0% chance you're going to survive. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um. <laughs> so uh, we knew, my, my husband and I, we knew going into the, the interview with the doctor because I felt it was wrong. I felt it for a long time. And, you know, they didn't want to give me the scan and well, once they did, the result wasn't this bad. And I knew what they were going to say. I knew they were going to say, you know, there's no chance you're going to survive. Because, you know, I've read the statistics, I'm analytical, I read everything, you know. Um, so, first thing I said is, you know, I'm an analyst, it's my job. You probably got the numbers wrong and, you know, there's always a chance that there's someone who can survive. But, <laughs> um, well, somehow, I, you know, I did, I did chemo, I did all the, you know, I did everything. I did diet, I did everything. You can think of magnets, every, all the shit that you got there. Matter to matter. Yeah, and I, at first I, I had a lot of faith 
thinking, you know, I can beat this. And I was very strong in the beginning, but somehow they had to repeat to me over and over again, you know, whatever you do, it's not gonna work, you won't survive. There's no chance in hell <laughs> you're gonna live through this. You might live a mom bummer, but that's it. So no, no chance, they, at some point, they just basically said, you know, go home and die. And after the chemo and everything <laughs> they did to me, I was just sent home and there was like no doctor in the Netherlands who would even, you know, help me and I went to Germany and I did expensive treatment, we lost all our money, <laughs> we went through lots of uh, difficult times and well then you showed up in my YouTube stream. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I thought, well, that's finding someone I can relate to, you know, it's the science, it's not like woody woody stuff, it's, you know, I, I get this, and you know what, let's just try it. So I read the book, I watched the videos, I did everything, I started meditations, and I thought, like, if I have the chance, and I, I, I wasn't sure how much longer I had at the time, so but I said, if I have the chance to go to an advanced event, I will, and then finally, uh, what was it, like two months ago, I was in Mallorca, and... Well, still, I went there, and it was like the lady said, I, I had the feeling like I'm, I might not be worthy enough, you know, to receive the healing, because there were people in wheelchairs, and I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm not, perhaps not be worthy enough to, to get healed, and I know on the last day I got the coin from you, and then I felt so much love, and, and uh, the, the, the gratitude, right. yes, already, just from being selected, I guess, um, and... And gratitude is... <laughs> okay, just curious. And that's true, that's true. Because, <laughs> and you know, I, I'm not like, I'm, I'm, I'm very analytical, so <laughs> I wasn't uh, like up to that. I, I didn't have the experience, you know, with the movement and everything, and I was, you know, still trying to get beyond the analytical mind. And I was struggling really hard for the whole week. And I <laughs> can only tell that this is so true because I know before yeah, I was I had healing on the last day, and when I walked into the room, I felt it already I knew I was okay and I, 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 I lay down and you people you, they were still standing up you know still uh, putting their hands over their hearts and I lay down on the ground and instantly my body started shaking and I was like this and just and that went on and on and on and, and at some point it felt I think it felt it felt like something just wrapped here something inside of me just pulled it out and I thought it's it's gone it's lifted it really <laughs> Listen closely because that was the experience, yes? Now, there should be an effect in her biology as a result of it, yes or no? Yes, so, well, here comes the cool part. <laughs> so, you know, and I, it happened and I was laughing and crying and I was so, I felt so blessed and, and I went home the same night and I, I came home and I told my husband, you know, I think, I think I'm okay, I, I think I'm healed. I'm pretty sure, but yeah, it, it's, you know, it's difficult with cancer. It's not like I could instantly see or anything. So I was like, okay, now, you know, now we, I feel, I feel I'm okay, but we have to prove it, you know, because otherwise people are not going to believe me. So we went for a scan, uh, just, and just before we came to this event, I had the result, and I done a PET-CT scan, and they actually pulled me to, twice <laughs> to, to make sure, and <laughs> there came the words I thought I would never hear from a person wearing a white coat, but he said, you know what, there's absolutely nothing to worry about, there's no single trace of cancer left in your body. <laughs> And she decided to go to Dr. Joe's uh, seminar because she received a book of Dr. Joe Dispenza and she read it and she decided she had no other option left for her because she was there was no medical solution for her. And she said, I, I have no, no other thing to, to do. This is my only chance. So she decided to go being accepted, not having any experience of this kind of work before. Be even before she has... The, the, the healing meditation on her, her testimony is that she was standing up in front of the eight people and then she had the, her mystical experience. Her spiritual experience was in herself, she had the certainty that she was cured. And then she said to the guys, I don't know, but I know that I'm cured now. I know that because I, I, I have her phone number now and we have talked several times because for me, Knowing her was a tremendous experience because when she was giving her experience, I couldn't stop crying because I knew that she was, it was like she was there standing 
speaking to me, not to anyone else. And then she said, I know that I am cured already. And then she said that the other eight guys were looking at each, at each other like, but we haven't done anything yet. And she says, I don't know how to explain, but what I know is that I am cured already. And then she received the, the, the healing and she went to, to Holland. And after a month, she did the tests and the cancer was completely gone. I knew that that was the experience that I was going to receive. In Sunday, I received the coin to be a Healy. So in Sunday, when I walked and I laid down to receive the healing, I'm going to tell you my experience. I just saw a very bright light coming from above to hit my heart and my my head so strong and this light just surrounded me all over. My All my body started to shake. I started to feel like convulsions and I started speaking languages also. And oh, yeah. yeah, I was just so, so filled with this l loving source. I was, I, I couldn't stop crying. I, in my conscious, I just kind of knew, it's not that I heard a, a specifically some words, but it, I, I, I knew that this divinity was telling me that everything in my life was going to be okay, but I had to, but now I had to teach all the things that I've learned. And this is what I've been doing since, telling people my experience. And now I've been teaching what I've learned to other people. Wow. Now having heard you said this, it makes sense to hear you say that cancer was a gift of love to you. Yeah. Because it put you in a place where you were really in touch with your heart. Your heart was opened because your heart was opened. You were connected to the divine. The divine and you were now in this love affair where the divine had always been there, but now you were completely focused on the divine and the divine was just holding you and you didn't resist. You surrendered, you let go. You believed that the divine, we know that the divine doesn't lie. Love is truth and yeah. you didn't question it. You didn't doubt it. You just knew that you knew you accepted, you received it, you embraced it, you took it in, and then you were in this, I'm gonna call it a bubble, because as you know, when we were, when not only when we were there, but that's, luckily that's something we take away with us, that once you're plugged in, you're in. But it is an extraordinary feel, you could feel the love in the air. And I have to say, I come from a fairly religious family, there's a lot of clergy in my family, and so I've always been raised in a church setting. I, I can honestly say I have never felt a group of a thousand people be so loving. All I didn't know a single person when I got there. There were a yeah. thousand people. So there were literally a thousand strangers. You kind of feel like you want to kiss everybody. <laughs> and it was, it was hearts were wide open. Everybody. Yeah. And the thing is like, everybody genuinely would approach me and I would genuinely have this just like this brotherly and sisterly love, tall, short, dark, didn't matter. It was just, I thought this is how synagogues, churches, places of worship, this is how it's supposed to be. It was the, just such a pure face of energy that you could feel the energy in the air. And there was this, I want to call it like a magnetic, I don't know if you would call it the same thing, but it was like this magnetic love joy that just seemed to pull you up and um, it pulled you up and opened you up kind of at the same time. Yeah. And it, was, it was, it was, it's undescribable. And the thing is, um, I remember being a little concerned the last day. I thought, oh my gosh, the vibe here is so extraordinary. The, the love, the, the, by the end of the week, of course, you know, a thousand people. I probably don't know exactly a thousand people, but I did get to meet hundreds of people who are still in contact with like yourself and connected with many that I didn't con connect with them there, but post the event we've connected. And the thing is that energy, once you're tuned into it, it continues. I don't know. I'm sure there's probably a way of undoing it if somebody, cause you know, your free will is your free will. But it's not like other things that you go to. This is much different. You're still plugged into that energy. There's almost like a heightened sense of awareness or a greater sense of, would you say that it's like a greater sense of openness or it's kind of hard to describe in words, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I also agree with you with, with this thing that this finally is energy. But if we translate this energy to an emotion, 
I think that what we had the opportunity to see is exactly what I think that the real and true love can make to each and every one of us. Because when we were sensing this authentic love, the 1,000 people who were there, the only thing that we want to do is to be in contact with the other people and to share what we're feeling. This is an extraordinary thing to experience because I think that is one of the things that most amaze all the people that go to this to these events because you cannot describe exactly what it produces into each one in what it is to feel that a thousand people are generating and meditating to generate these elevated emotions of joy of love of gratitude mm -hmm. and what it feels and what it changes in, in every people inside is something undescribable you have to be there to understand what it is you have to live it what i also think is that now since you have experience that you don't have to be with a thousand people to be in contact with this energy with this love experience uh, again you can experience it in your room alone yes what you have learned is that the only thing you have to do is to open your heart to be in contact with this again with this energy the only thing that you need to do is to open your heart and if you do it and you're genuine and you're authentic you're gonna be in contact with again with this divinity with this energy of love yeah and and i think that's the most exciting thing it's because we are not dependent upon being at dr joe's monastery or at his gatherings at any of his events it's not like that's the only time you're going to have that no, the, exactly. the big way is that we are empowered. We have this incredible energy vortex all around us. It's like the thousand of us, no question, we're connected, but we're also connected because there's no time, space, dimension, or reality that's excluded. Anyone who has done this type of work, Dr. Joe's, you know, I think there's like, you know, more than 16,000 or, or 17,000 just in the mon leaving the monastery Facebook group. Oh, really? Um, wow. Yeah, just for the people who have been to the monastery, to his, to his live events, who are advanced students. But separate from that, there's many other Dr. Joe meditators who have studied either just online, who haven't been to a live event. Absolutely, yeah. And that's who knows how many hundreds of thousands of people. And, now, and then there's the greater collective of meditators and people who really are open-hearted in a place of joy. So we're all, now we're all tapped in. We know how to be in that space and stay in that space so that you do have an elevated emotion of love because your your heart is open and you're embracing love and you're sharing love you're open-hearted and you are genuinely and it's until you feel that genuine love and that genuine gratitude and appreciation it just somehow seems to open up your heart like you said it it explodes your heart even more yeah, and yeah. it's like it's a kind of a euphoric feeling that's kind of like you've never felt anything like that before and i remember thinking like prior to going to dr joe's event back in 2013 i made my decision to open my heart i didn't know how to do it but i mm -hmm. said okay i know that i'm supposed to do this i don't know how to do it I just kept on meditating, asking my angels, God, to show me how to open my heart. And so it was a slow and gradual process. And at Dr. Joe's, I was really able to, I don't know if concretize is an actual word, but to make concrete the distinction between our true self, that loving part that is always connected to God, that never is disconnected, which is our soul, and separating that distinction from our ego, our brain, and then the feelings and emotions that are lodged into our body, which sometimes bubble up into the brain and into the ego, and then fight with our true self and lie to us and tell us things like, oh, you're not doing it right. You're not doing the breath right. You're not sitting up straight enough in the meditation. Everybody else is getting this, but not you. Oh, you're not doing it good enough. You, you're going to have to meditate for years before you get this right. That open heart thing. Other people can open their hearts easily and naturally, but that's the freaking ego. <laughs> and it became so crystal clear. It's like, oh, like the first, that was my first big aha, the first 24 hours. It's like, oh, so my awareness seeing that, it's like, it was it's, it's, so it's myself not letting me do my job. Yes, it was <laughs> keeping, was, me. it was fighting me all this time. And I'm like, oh, that's what helped me as our 
we were part of the lucky group that uh -huh. uh, I'll never forget the second day when he said, oh, we're going to be doing a challenge course, blah, blah, blah. I said, challenge course? What is he talking about? And he started describing, you know, starting to prep us for the challenge course. I'm like, wait a minute. Nobody said, I don't remember seeing, hearing, reading anything about a challenge course. And of course, they don't tell you what the challenge course is going to be. You just know yeah. it's a challenge course. So I have no idea what it could possibly be. And then he says, the Golden Eagles are going to be the first group that are going to go up starting tomorrow. And I'm like, oh gosh, here we go again. So it's like, I don't even have the benefit of conferring with another group to see what the challenge was, yeah, yeah, yeah. See what yeah. I could expect. Yeah, um, tell me, so, so I know if I want to go or if I can't. Or I'm can not I go. chicken out or whatever? to yeah. prep for it, you know, and it's again, wanting to know, it's that fear of the unknown and, you know, wanting to control, which he talks about the entire thing. It's about letting go, surrendering, trusting <laughs> that the universe has your back, which is so hard to do. I'm uh, recovering a personality type. Uh, okay, so, wow. So now we have to do this challenge course. And then I was one of the first people that Jace picked, you know, he, you know <laughs> went outside, it's like, I remember Katie, she's, you know, my blonde version from Connecticut. Yeah. She's, you know, not the same. I can see her eye to eye because she's five foot one like I am. And it's like, so I didn't have the benefit of seeing people complete anything. So I, I was truly going on the blind, just looking at the obstacle course and going, oh my gosh, that's like really high up in the air. It's like, what are they going to have us do up there? And, and then it came to pass, of course, but the, that was the first real test. Cause after we would had, I don't know, we had over 20, it was a super yeah, day. That you, you, you want me to say something Lian, that yeah. just came up to my mind, this first challenge is, it is like, what it means for me to what it means for me to surrender is it that if I fall from uh, being up there and I die is going to be okay to me uh, because I have to trust. That's exactly my experience because I had to accept that what the divinity had for had for me is that I was because the possibility for me not to live it was also the possibility for me to live. So I had to trust in the divinity. One of his answers could be not to live, but if you trust, you just surrender and you accept yeah. whatever the answer is. And it is because you surrender, when you uh, surrender, then you accept your acceptation. Then you start to feel this gratitude and loving emotions. Yeah. And the paradox is that when you start feeling those emotions, miracle happens to your life. Yes. It's that letting go and certain, which is the most difficult thing. It's the most difficult thing. Yeah, I totally have to agree with you so wholeheartedly in that. The irony, you know, a lot of people are afraid of death. I personally am not afraid of death because I've always thought of death as in you go to sleep into this deep sleep and then your physical body just never wakes up. You just like drift away. That's always been my perception. I'm not yeah. afraid of death. But I have been afraid of pain, yeah. avoiding pain, like you have no get out. So my only concern is what level of pain, if there's going to be pain in order to die, I'm afraid of the pain that I might have to endure in order to pass on. So I'm not, I'm okay with dying because I figure it's a free state. I'm going to be in a- There, there you have an intention to work with. But exactly. So the whole pain thing. And then of course, you know, in my case, I came to Dr. Joe's work because I had been hit I don't know how I wasn't killed, but I was hit by an Orange County Transit Authority bus while I was riding my bike. Similar to Dr. Joe, Dr. Joe was hit by an SUV truck. I was hit by a bus and wow. I went flying off my bike. I had a traumatic brain injury, had a neck injury, back injury, ugly scar. And so of course I was suffering a lot of pain. I didn't die, so I was very grateful grateful that I didn't die. I didn't crush any limbs. I could have crushed a limb. None of that happened. But for me, the, the whole pain, physical pain and emotional pain, pain is pain, physical, emotional. <laughs> yeah, still, probably the emotional pain, sometimes it, it hurts worse. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Sometimes it is, it's, uh, it, it's unbearable. You feel like you're going to emotional pain sometimes feels like you want to die because it's so bad. Yeah, you want it yeah, to stop. Because it's unbearable. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, you just want it to stop. And if you don't, one of the things that I've learned and meditation really helps with this, because like you said, if you stop resisting the pain and just say, okay, exactly. Where is it in your body? 
that you're feeling the pain and you look at the pain and you realize that, okay, I see it. I acknowledge it. I'm not going to push against it anymore. You just let it be there. And now I've learned to ask, okay, okay, why, what is it that you're trying to tell me? Cause you pain is not purposeless. Pain is always with purpose. Like your cancer that caused maybe your physical pain wasn't great, but the emotional psychological and spiritual pain that's like oh my gosh that's like off the chart so okay you sit there with that and you go now okay i see you i hear you what is it that you're trying to tell me because it's it's just like having a baby it's trying to give birth that pain is giving birth to something that you need to know that for whatever reason it's been a blind spot yeah and now now you're fine, you know, the divine gets your attention with that pain and you're like, okay, I'm tired of fighting. I'm just going to let go. I'm going to surrender. If I'm going to die doing this activity, then, hey, it wasn't a bad run. It's like, you know, yeah, I had some pain here at the end, but it's over and you let go. We have to activity. remember that every time Dr. Joe says that every time we go to the divinity, uh, he, Dr. Joe says he, uh, that he has never let him down. It's so, true. Yeah, nobody's going to have a, an experience that is not going to help them in some way. That is so, he says there's no such thing as a bad meditation. Every meditation yeah. is a good meditation. And it's so funny because several months ago in meditation, I remember thinking to myself and I was telling somebody, it's like, you know, a lot of my meditations are, are just pure consciousness where the only, the way I languaged it, I catch myself now saying it, but it's true. That's how I was thinking about it and how I perceived it. The only benefit I had was feeling peace. Now think about that for a second. How many people are going to meditation trying to feel peace? And now I'm like, oh, the only benefit I'm, I'm receiving is feeling peace. So my perception was that it was a a flat meditation because I didn't have a mystical experience. I didn't see colors, geometric patterns, <laughs> any of the other stuff. It was just, it was just this profound, deep peace. Of course, I felt very connected and it was peaceful and serene. So fast forward a few months later in a meditation that we are doing during the quarantine, you know how our group keeps on getting together all over the world doing these scheduled meditations to help people heal, not just from COVID, but from everything, right? Yeah. And one of the revelations that I had was that during those meditations that I've been calling them, now it seems so like I was insulting and I never meant an insult to the divine, but those meditations that I was saying that they were flat and they were, the only benefit I got was, was peace, which is still a benefit. I was in my ignorance, I was diminishing the value. Uh oh, there it is again the value of those meditations and what yeah. they revealed to me it's like during those flat meditations those meditations where you you thought you're thinking your left brain is thinking the only benefit is you're feeling the body peace is like oh by the way we've been downloading light codes into you we've been activating light codes not only during your meditations but also while you're sleeping we've been downloading dimensional overlays which i was like dimensional overlays i've never even heard of that terminal what the heck is it which if you recall <laughs> what, what i'm going to do with that <laughs> i'm like what is a dimensional overlay what does it mean i don't understand i've never heard of that i don't understand what the purpose how am i supposed to uh, who's going to give me the manual so i know what to do with that exactly give me the you know the outline give me <laughs> yeah. the, the dr joe book that i can read on it no, nothing. Those meditations where maybe I didn't even feel peace. It was just quiet. It's like, oh no, just, it's like, it's like, you don't get it, Lillian. You don't need to do anything. All you have to do is meet us here in meditation. We do it all. All we want you to do is to do is to connect. All we have to do is open our heart, be willing to take the time to be in that space. And they do 99.9%. .9 yeah. You just have to make the time and do you, this. You have to, to open your heart and then to trust. And to trust. We tend to want to, there's always a little sliver in our life. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's personal relationships. Maybe it's both ends. Maybe it's our workout. It doesn't matter. 
you know, our lives are so full of so many different aspects of us. The thing is, we are called to, in our entirety, our entire lives, just surrender and trust that, you know, we're tuned in, we're tapped in, we're turned on to that divine energy. And you're walking living proof that you can have a death sentence by multiple accounts, by multiple levels, by multiple conditions in your body. And just like that, it can be healed. You just have to have a faith of a child. You just have to know that you know that you know. You know, people who are in pain, people who are in sick, sickness in any way, shape, or form, all, I think for the most part, have a feeling there's got to be a better way. There's somehow, somewhere, someone, someplace, there's got to be a miracle out there for me. And yeah, yeah, except it's not out there. It's in your heart. You just have to shut up, quiet down, open your heart, connect to the divine. And if you don't know how, then ask the divine for guidance. And then I would start with Dr. Joe's books are so well written, so well explained, as well as all of his videos. You and I, neither of us, we don't get any money or any, you know, other than the the profound love, which is pretty awesome, that we get from sharing this with people, which is absolutely the purpose of, of this show. And it's the, it's the key that unlocks everything, everything without, everything leaves nothing out. I think the highest calling that we can have, I don't care what your profession is, is to just be in that heart-centered space where we can completely show up open-hearted and tune in to ourselves so we can tune in to the divine. Yes, I also, I, I know that it's, it's just like what you said, that it's a call to share with others because when you experience this, the, the, the results, the benefits of this work, then you get so much more than just this feeling of being in peace. You, you, re, you really change completely from the inside. Yeah. And you, you, you just don't change in an emotional state. You, you literally change because your, your life turns to be a different life than it was. It, it affects everything in your life. And then because you, since you feel like that, what, what you realize is that there comes a time that, it, that for you, it's time to start to share it with other people, to, 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 to send them the message. Because there's a lot of people that right now is being in emotional pain or physical pain, and they don't know what to do or where to go or where to find the answers. And we're blessed that we have the tools now. Yes, yes, yes. So tell me a little bit more about, I know that one of the graphics here that you sent us here, you talk apparently sharing with more and more people every day. And um, you say here to live is to change. And you're sharing not only your story, but also the practices that have brought you to this point that I'm going to say, don't keep you in this space, but that elevates you because that is, I think one of the most spectacular things about this work is like, it's very humbling because we recognize at a greater level, how much we don't know. And you realize how much more infinite possibilities there are. And you also start to recognize, see, feel, to a certain degree, understand different energies and how powerful they are and how they're all around us all the time. Sometimes we seek them out and we're elevated and other times they pull us up. We're, we're just showing up and the next thing you know, you're pulled up, which is uh, really unexpected because I don't think anybody expects to be pulled up, but we are. I think, you know, by definition you were healed. So you were obviously pulled up. So your, your vibe is even higher now, which is why you are in radiant health. Are you primarily sharing this? I mean, uh, thank goodness to the internet, we can go global. Uh, from a physical standpoint, are you able to share more one-on-one -on -one with people in person or how, how is it that you're yeah. sharing your story? Yeah, thank you. You're doing thank you. Yeah. yeah, I'm doing it in both ways. I'm doing this, sharing it one, one by one. Some people call me and they ask me for help. They want me to tell them my experience and they want them to tell me and to explain them the tools that I've learned and how I changed my life so they can apply these tools for their own life. But I am also doing this, these workshops in, because there were some friends here in, in, in Mexico, entrepreneurs that helped me to understand how it was that I had to start sharing these learnings. I, I didn't have a plan and I didn't even know that at some point I was starting to doing this. Someday one friend of me says, he gets close to me and says, 
last year they knew that I had no no income because I had to sell the business that I had last year. So, so I had to so I could travel and start to do what I had to do to find my miracle. And yeah. then this friend comes to me and says, I want to invite you to my company so you can tell them your experience and I'm going to pay you for that because I know that I'm going to help you by doing that. And I said, well, thanks a lot. And so I went to this company with this friend and then some other friend called me. And then after a couple of friends that I, I went to their companies, then I said, I, I think I can start doing this and to receive an income also to share my experience. Yeah. And and some of these friends, then they come to me and they say, man, you have told us your experience already. Since you're still alive, we're sure that, that we can share with, you, with us more than just your, your experience. You can share us what you learned. So prepare something and, and, and teach us all what you've learned because we want to know what you did and we want to start doing the same thing that you did. So I started to do that because my friends asked me to do that. Right now, I am having the opportunity and I'm grateful for that. Have a, a like a workshop, eight weeks, two hour, two hours every week, and I just explain them what I learned, and I teach them what I am doing with the meditation and with the tools that I learned. This picture that you have, there is a, a statue of the of a virgin. With this picture, uh, I was in, in Medjugorje. It's a, a, a virgin sanctuary, the country of Bosnia. When I was in Italy, I have a brother, he's a priest, and he invited me to go to be, in, to be a week with him there. It's fantastic how the grace acts and how when a person has his heart open, it doesn't matter path is, but if you have your heart open, you're going to receive the, the gifts of being with the divinity. So when I was there, if you can see in this picture, I was completely alone. There was only one person on the left. When I was there, by then I had read many books, a couple of books of Joe Dispenza. I was thinking, I wanted, to, I was, I know, I remember that I was meditating and praying. And I was saying to the Virgin, that I, what I wanted to know is what was the next step for me. I wanted, I didn't want to run, but, but I wanted to be certain that the, the step that I was taking was certain, was sure. That was the month of March. And I know, I, I knew that my time limit was August. So I was, I was being heart open and I was just kind of being in the present moment, trying to receive what the divinity uh, uh, wanted to show me. And the, the, the incredible thing, Lillian, was that what I received was this. For the, for the divinity, there is not such, such thing that there is a, a hard miracle to do or an easy miracle to do. For the divinity, they're all the same. It's, it's, it's absolutely no way that there's going to be any obstacle because it's pure love and absolute love. I started to feel like there was a, a hard miracle, a hard miracles they were for God, they were hard miracles to do and easy miracles to do. And, and I, it was kind of, how is that possible? And then uh, I realized that uh, an easy miracle to do was to heal a body. That was very easy for God to do, to heal a body. Because in, for him to do that, he doesn't need you. He doesn't need anyone. Yeah. If you cut yourself, you don't have to do anything for that to be healed. It genuinely happens that it, it gets healed. So mm -hmm. I, was, I was thinking like that. And then I said, well, since you don't need us to heal our body, and that's a very easy miracle for you to do, what are the hard ones? And then I realized that the hard miracles for him to do was the, the miracles that has to do with our heart. Because to heal from our hearts, he needs us. Because he needs our will and our heart to be open so our heart can, can be can be healed. These, these things that had to do with resentments, with guilt, with sorrow. After this, I was, I, I remember I was crying like a, like, a, like a kid. And then I said to God, I don't want you to heal my body. I want you to heal from my inside, from my heart, because I know that if you help me to heal, you help me to heal my, my heart, my body is going to be healed. That was my experience when I was there. So what I learned there, I learned about this other thing after the faith that is how to accept his grace and to surrender of whatever he's going to send to you. 
because I knew that it was for me a truth with no doubt that there has something in my heart to have, who had to be healed because the diagnosis of, of terminal cancer, even though I felt like I had no big resentments to somebody, that was a, a, a personal line because since I had this diagnosis, there was probably not consciously, but there was a lot of things that had to be healed in my heart. So I opened my heart and I said to him, you help me to heal everything that you know that there is in my heart that has to be healed. For, Forget about my body, but if you help me to heal all that, my body's going to be healed. Wow, that's a huge takeaway. That yeah. is monumental. And I love the fact that you languaged it saying that the divine doesn't even need us to, yeah. to heal or to create anything. All miracles, for the most part, are easy. There's only one miracle that is hard for the divine, and it's because the divine will not take away your free will. The greatest gift he gave you was your free will. So yeah. the only way that this is going to work is if you use your free will to allow the divine to come in. Yeah, that's the that's only thing we need to do. That's it. That's the only allow thing. him to 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 work with us. That's an incredible thing. That's an incredible thing. We need to allow them, and and we don't understand that. We don't. We haven't yet get to this awareness because when we when we know that in our hearts, then everything turns out to be so very simple wow so in essence we have to experience it's starting to make more more and more sense every day to me and especially with your sharing your story the reasons why we have to experience heartbreak our hearts have to be broken so that they're cracked wide open so that then we are finally willing to let go and surrender and seek him first you know in the Old Testament, there's a scripture that says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be given to you as well. And lean not on your own understanding, but trust in him and he'll make your path straight. And if we just get out of our own way and say, okay, I let go, I, I just, this is painful. I don't know what to do. You just welcome in the divine, then the divine will go, okay, finally, finally, finally. This is what it took. It took this level of pain for you to finally come to me and, 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 and allow if you, me. If you see it with the with Dr. Joe's teachings, that he says exactly the same thing with another words, but he says mm -hmm. the same thing. Yeah. And it's like because we when we have that heartbreak, there's been part of us that we have fallen from grace. We've missed the mark. Yeah. And so we need to get back to pointing to true north. And yeah. the only way to do that is you have to have an open heart. You have to choose to have an open heart. Open your heart. Allow yourself to feel that week that we were there in Cancun. I, it's like, it was a crying fest. I was bawling, crying. Every time I turned, I'm like, am I going <laughs> to, some of them were tears of joy. Some of them were exuberant. Some of them, it was pain being let go. And it's like, oh my, things would come yeah. up. And I was able to cry freely and easily. There was no judgment there, no criticism. Everyone was pretty much, everybody kind of, you know, we were all in our, even though we were a collective, we were all in our own bubbles at the same time. Where you yeah. in your zone. It, not really it was amazing to see a thousand people being so joyful, all, all being together, experiencing yeah. the same Every, thing. Everybody was united. It's not like 80% or 90% of the yeah. it was, and 10%, they're like, just going is uh, does this really work no everybody was of united mind we all were feeling the same yeah. yeah we were all feeling this the same and i think that's why the love was so powerful there and why you know we've taken it with we're all thousand of us are still connected to this very day and time and even with more of those who are in the same vibrational frequency so you know it's funny right before you said those last two things i was going to ask you what are your big three your biggest three takeaways and your comment about, you know, miracles, easy miracle versus a hard miracle. You basically answered that having that open heart. That's the path. That's the doorway. It's, it's always been inside us it's and we stop denying ourselves of that and knowing that the divine only wants what's best for us and will only give us wonderful beneficial loving gifts it's not like he's there to punish or harm or create more pain because it's not yeah. about that there's grace if anything yeah. he wants to spare you pain but there's nothing but that only grace yeah there's only grace there's only grace yeah. 
Oh my gosh, Eduardo, do you have anything exciting that you want to share with your group? <laughs> I think I've shared food? a lot of or exciting things. Do you have a, <laughs> have a special program? Or I mean, I think that's awesome that you're going to different companies and talking to groups because every group of people that I know of, there's, there's always people that need healing on many different levels. So what's, what's coming up? What do you have coming up that's new and exciting? What's coming up is sharing my experience and sharing what I learned. Uh, and because of the pandemia, I couldn't even think that at some point I was going to be doing this teaching in a virtual way. So now I have a petition from people from New York that they want me to give them a workshop of what I learned. And it's fantastic because it is expanding. And for me, just like you said at the beginning, I know that it is like a call. I keep doing the work of meditating every day, probably more than two hours a day. And so for me, this experience is extending. I am knowing that my inner experience is growing my relationship with the, divine, with the divine is also growing when I speak about this it's like it's it's really it's coming out from within and I know that the people is getting is, is receiving this message and I also know Lilian that because of my experience I am a placebo for all the people say that again I am in some way, because of my experience, I am a placebo for all the people. Yes, absolutely. Some people have a very hard time to believe. And if they don't believe, they cannot do anything for their lives in order to change. When I appear to them and I explain to them and I say to them why I live and what I learned, and I tell them that if I receive a miracle for my life, they can also receive the same benefit of having miracles for their own lives. They all have to do is to have faith, have surrender, and believe, and, and only open their hearts. That's the only thing they have to do, to open their hearts. And they can experience uh, miracles for themselves. That's a, fant a fantastic thing for me to do. I think that's absolutely beautiful. That's so stunning to say. And I do believe that you are, you are a placebo for people. When they see you, they feel your love, your joy, your authenticity, how genuine you are. They see how vibrant and healthy you are how you have, you really have done the impossible. You give them hope that they can do it too. And I think uh, another takeaway for anyone who's gonna be watching this anywhere in the world is if you don't know how to get that belief, that could be the miracle that you ask the divine for. The divine can put in your heart the belief that you don't think you have. It can put, it can create the miracle of you unexplainably, just like, you did, Eduardo. You just knew that you knew that you knew that you were going to be healed and that you were going to be fine. And that's an extraordinary amount of belief and knowing and faith that you had. I love the fact that you asked that the divine heal your heart first before you didn't care about the body because you knew that if the heart was healed, that the whole body would, he would be healed. And so maybe someone watching this right now, they just need to, it's like, you know what? Maybe you don't believe that anything else has worked for you. This is the only thing you've got left. Just ask for the gift of belief that you would have such a profound sense of knowingness. You don't need to know how, you don't need to know where, just be willing to say, okay, I wanna open my heart and all I want is the gift of this profound knowing and belief so that I can do all the other things. Yeah. And then you'll be off to the races because if that's your biggest challenge, which is when you don't have it, that's an impossible. It's like, you know, the tallest mountain. It's like, hey, yeah. I I can't scale that tall mountain. There's like, are you kidding me? That's like Mount Everest. There's, that's not going to happen. I'm not a hiker. Yeah, you know? Sure. Yeah, I'm yeah, a, that's pro probably because you, so far on, up until now, you have been doing, uh, trying to change your life, doing it only by your own will. Yeah. And the, with this information, and with these teachings, or with this learning, now is probably the time to do it with your will, but inviting the divine will to work with you. Eduardo, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for sharing your story, sharing your, Thanks. sharing all your experiences. I know that I've had a little corner in my life that I've had trouble letting go and surrendering there. And I really feel encouraged. I kind of feel like there was a release just doing this interview with you. So thank you so much, my friend. I'm so excited. We get to connect every day. Thanks to technology. We get to talk almost every day. On yeah, please. And I am very, I'm very thankful that you invited me. I'm very open that please invite me again. I enjoy it so much. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. You're, you're quite welcome. And for our listeners, I want you to know, Eduardo, he can language this and he can share this with you in English and in Spanish. Live right now in Mexico City? No, I live, I live in a city called Leon. I, I told you, it is like five hour drive north from Mexico City. Okay. Leon is a very, beautiful, a very beautiful city in Mexico. Fantastic. Thank you for being on the show today. And as usual, we will sign off. I'm going to leave it with the last graphic here so that people have a way of contacting you. Your phone number, your email is here. We'll be sure to put it in the show description below. Thank you for tuning in, tapping in, turning on to Love and Money Secrets TV. And for now, as we always say, Ciao for now. Thank you. Thank you, Lilian. God bless you. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you.